Hello and welcome to the Cat Virus Vet School video 3 in the series Does Tommy Have FIP? If you haven't watched the first two videos, please do so before watching this one. I just want to remind you that these videos are for veterinary professionals and veterinary undergraduate students only. This video does contain images which some viewers will find distressing. Let us have a brief recapitulation. Tommy was an adult male neutered domestic short hair presented in 2009 with Anisophoria. In part two of this video series, we examined in detail his history to establish whether or not FIP should be on our list of differential diagnoses. The result was mostly negative. There was a query around whether or not he could have become infected with feline coronavirus, virus that causes FIP, because in 2006 he had come from a rescue household of 28 cats and at the time of presentation he was living in a three-cat household. So we put both a tick and a question mark next to that parameter. However, we also know that the majority of cats who develop FIP do so within three years of becoming infected. This is a survival curve of cats who are naturally infected with feline coronavirus. Each step down represents deaths to FIP and the curve falls off most steeply within the first 18 months. So we now know that the chance of FIP being a cause of Tommy's clinical signs were less than 5%, i.e. a 1 in 20 chance. As we work through the following steps of the FIP diagnosis algorithm, we should be able to rule FIP in or out for this cat. We now move on to the second part of the FIP diagnostic algorithm, the clinical signs. In part one of this video series, we asked you the question, what is the name of this condition? And there really are a number of possible answers you could have given which would be correct. Anisocoria, in other words, the pupils are uneven. Uveitis or iritis, inflammation of the iris. When I have asked groups of veterinarians about this photograph, some answered meiosis. In other words, they concluded that the pupil of the right eye was abnormally constricted. Now this is an important point, because we want to know whether we're dealing with an intraocular condition or a possible neurological one. Meiosis can be caused by uveitis, as well as neurological and other conditions, but it is the left eye that was affected not the right, so meiosis would be an incorrect answer on this occasion. Horner syndrome would also be an incorrect answer, because there was no evidence of ptosis. I hope you managed to catch the light reflex in the short film. I slowed the video down to try to let you see that. I'll run it for you again now. If you noticed it, you would have seen that the pupils both constricted as he turned towards the light on his right side. My next questions were, which eye is affected, and how do you know? And the correct answer is that it was the left, not the right eye, which was affected, and you know that for two reasons. First, look at the iris colour. It is darker in the left eye. Second, look at the edge of the pupil in the left eye. It is uneven, irregular, but perfectly even in the right eye. Back to the FIP diagnosis algorithm, we now know to put a tick next to the intraocular signs rather than the neurological signs. The next question from part one was to make a list of differential diagnoses of uveitis, and I would hope that you put FIP on your list. Jinx et al. from North Carolina Veterinary School published a study of 120 cats with uveitis, 19 cats i.e. 15.8%, were diagnosed with FIP. The average age of all uveitis cases was 7.62 years, while the average age of the cats diagnosed with FIP was 1.82 years, which was younger than Tommy. In the study of 120 cats, nearly 35% had coronavirus antibodies. In other words, twice as many cats had coronavirus antibodies as had FIP. 
While negative coronavirus serology is useful for ruling out FIP, positive serology only indicates that FIP is possible. Positive antibody test is never diagnostic of FIP. This is a key message which I cannot emphasize enough and which bears repeating. Negative feline coronavirus serology is useful for ruling out FIP, provided the test is sensitive enough, but a positive feline coronavirus antibody test is not diagnostic of FIP, even if it is called an FIP test. I'm going to show you some eyes of cats with FIP, and I want to emphasize that I'm not an ophthalmologist, and yet I can always find intraocular signs in cats with FIP. It just takes a bit of time and patience to do a thorough examination, including darkening the room and examining the eye with a slit lamp to look for aqueous flare. Look, if I can find the signs, you definitely can. I remember a cat I was treating for non-effuse of FIP. The cat had blue eyes, but one consultation he came in with green eyes, and for a moment I wondered if they'd brought the wrong cat. But the eyes really had changed colour from blue from blue to green due to FIP. This is Lady, a Sphinx cat who had FIP. You can see that she had bilateral uveitis. This is a British short hair cat with FIP and severe iritis of the left eye. I want to thank the brilliant veterinary ophthalmologist Dr. John Mould, not just for these photos of the retina of a cat with FIP, but also for giving me tutorials in examining the eyes of cats with FIP. Here we have the optic papilla, and if you follow the blood vessel from it, going right on your screen, you can see that the vessel actually enters an FIP pyogranuloma and comes out the other side. The eye is one area of the body where you can see the FIP lesions without surgery. This photo is not out of focus. It is hazy because of vitreous flare. Aqueous and vitreous flare are clinical signs you sometimes get in FIP because the pathogenesis involves extravasation of macrophages from the blood vessels. I will put a link in the show notes to my animation of the pathogenesis of FIP and I'll also put a link to John's website in case you're in the UK and wish to refer an ophthalmology case to him. This is a cat immediately after euthanasia for FIP. I'm showing you this photograph to illustrate that the keratic precipitates were mostly hidden by the third eyelid and while he was alive, I had to get him to look up to see that they were present. In this cat, there are red blood cells in the anterior chamber, which would make you want to check the cat's blood pressure and urine-specific gravity, since intraocular hemorrhage is more commonly associated with raised blood pressure, although the posterior chamber is more often involved than the anterior chamber. This is an unusual presentation of non of FIP. In this cat with dry FIP, the uveitis was very subtle. You can just see the edge of my thumb in the top left corner where I was pulling up his upper eyelid to enable me to see the lesions on his iris. As I said earlier, you often have to take quite a bit of time looking at the eyes to find intraocular signs of FIP. But if you cannot find any, then in my view a diagnosis of FIP would be in doubt. Next on the list of differential diagnoses, let's put toxoplasmosis. We have seen photos of Tommy caught in flagrante with a mouse. Thus we know that he was a hunter, so had means to become infected with toxoplasma. If we had a toxoplasma flow chart, we would ask in the history, is he a hunter or has he been fed any raw meat? Eating or handling raw meat or salad prepared on an unwashed chopping board on which raw meat had previously been sitting is the main method by which humans become infected with toxoplasma, rather than by handling cat litter trays, which seems to be the first conclusion of too many medics. The toxoplasma oocyst takes two days to sporulate, i.e. to become infectious, 
and most litter trays are cleaned more frequently than every 48 hours. This is from the ABCD Toxoplasma Review published in JFIMS. You can find ABCD recommendations and fact sheets at www.abcd-vets.org for many of the conditions in this list of differential diagnoses of uveitis. Continuing with our list, Bartonella hensile and other Bartonella species. Bartonella hensile is the cat scratch disease organism and has been associated with uveitis both in cats and human beings. Neoplasia can present similarly to FIP. Here is a photo of the eyes of a cat with lymphoma taken from David Magg's excellent review of uveitis, which was published in JFIMS. Next, we have Lishmania. Being a Brit and having lived most of my life in Scotland, I've never personally seen a case of feline leishmaniasis, so I am showing you photographs of published cases. Cats have to be bitten by sand flies to acquire leishmania infection. Therefore, leishmaniasis occurs in countries with sand flies, such as Italy, Brazil or Spain. In this case, you can see lesions on the skin as well as the eye being affected. Here we have a leishmania case which looks very much like the FIP case we saw earlier, with hyphema in the anterior chamber. Now we come to something to really give you nightmares. And once again, I'm grateful to Dr. John Mould for sharing his photographs with me and for educating me about the phenomenon of eye damage following dentistry, which he published with his colleagues. In dogs, the dental elevator tends to slip off the upper premolar called the carnassial tooth when you're trying to extract that one, and it enters the eye from the front whereas in cats the dental instrument tends to enter the eye posteriorly as the vet tries to access the roots of the molars. You can see just how thin the skull is between the mouth and the eye socket on this cat skull. On the upper photograph you can see the tract of a dental elevator as it entered the cat's eye, pointed out with an arrow. Here is a close-up. And this is how the cat's eye looked before it was removed. This is another case where the cat lost his eye post-dentistry. This photograph of a skull shows the proper technique for handling a dental elevator. You can use your index finger as a stop to avoid this kind of damage to the eye. Last on our list, we have systemic mycosis and idiopathic. In many uveitis cases, the cause is never established and then you just wheel out the term idiopathic which is science speak for I haven't a clue. I do wonder how many of those are actually due to feline herpes virus. Feline herpes virus DNA was detected by PCR in the aqueous humour of 11 of 44 cats with uveitis, but also in the aqueous humour of one healthy cat. Where FHV is suspected, check whether the cat is under stress, for example due to overcrowding which is a very common stressor of cats. Too many cats in the household. Other common stresses include chronic disease, usually gingivitis, which is painful. My own cat gets transient FHV-related conjunctivitis when he has a furball, so I make sure he gets a small amount of dry food which contains psyllium each day to augment his predominantly wet food diet. Cats with low plasma arginine are more prone to FHV-related signs, so check that the patient gets real meat regularly and is not simply fed the same kibble diet constantly. It's important to give cats a varied diet. Another underdiagnosed cause of feline uveitis is the rabbit protozoal parasite Encephalitozoon cuniculi, which causes anterior uveitis and cataracts in cats and dogs. I'm not going to go through photos of all possible differentials. You get the message. It's impossible to tell the cause just by looking, unless, of course, there is obvious trauma to the cornea. All you can say is that the cat has uveitis, and then you have to try to discover the cause. However, it is absolutely possible to narrow down the list of differential diagnoses fairly simple. I'm not going to go through all the possible differentials of all the clinical signs of non-effusive FIP because we'd end up going through every disease of the cat. 
This video is about uveitis and about Tommy's case. At the end of this third video, we now have a list of differential diagnoses, and in the next video we're going to look at his in-house blood results, which is the next step of the FIP diagnostic flowchart. Then we're going to go through this differential diagnosis list, trying to narrow it down so that we can send the most efficient samples possible to a referral laboratory to try to establish his diagnosis and the best course of treatment for him. I want to dedicate this video to Fabienne and the members of the FIP Advisory and Care Group. Thank you for your support. Thank you for listening and I hope you'll join me in the next video.